So yeah, the Rangers were basically a bad team for the entire month of January, but what are some of the biggest takeaways from the most challenging month of the season for the Blue Shirts? What do they really need at the trade deadline? And will we see Brian Othman get another chance this season? You're locked on the New York Rangers, your daily podcast on the New York Rangers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, Blue Shirts fans, to episode number 993 of the Locked On New York Rangers podcast. I'm your host, John Chick. I just want to thank you guys, as always, for making Locked On New York Rangers your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. And today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets. If your best bet of $5 or more wins, visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started and we are of course part of the locked on podcast network your team every day so obviously uh doesn't take a genius to figure this out but very clearly the worst month of the season for the rangers was of course january and i I realize january is still ongoing here but you know obviously the rangers are done they're on their bye week you got the all-star break there as well and the rangers conclude january with a record of five seven and two i think the biggest hope from all of us is that Uh, The month of January indeed remains the Rangers' worst month of the season because if it keeps going this way, uh, you know, I I still think they'll make the playoffs pretty much no matter what happens. The cushion they have is is pretty enormous as far as, you know, like the last playoff spot is concerned. But if it keeps going the way it's been going, we're not going to like the way uh, that this season ends. Um, But if you want an optimistic way to look at this, and we try to be glass half full on here for the most part. Every now and then I got to call them out, but we try to be glass half full. I think the most optimistic way you can look at this is that even in a month, where the Rangers, um, you know, played their worst hockey and at times were just flat out bad, lethargic, you know, call it whatever you want to call it, just not executing, just not showing up to play hockey. Even in that month, they still ended up getting points in seven out of a possible 14 games. Of course, two of them were overtime losses, but regardless, what I just said holds true. Uh, They did end up getting points in half their games, at least one point. And now, as a whole, you know, total regular season record, still 30, 16, and 3. They have 63 points, two points ahead of the second place Canes. Uh, the Canes have a game in hand, but the Rangers would have the tiebreaker. So technically, the Rangers do control uh, their own destiny as far as winning the Metro the rest of the season. But as far as, you know, the struggles that have been going on lately and everything that's gone wrong, one of my biggest takeaways watching all of this unfold here is that the skid that the Rangers are going through. And hopefully it is just that. And hopefully they can uh, play better hockey in February. And we're going to look ahead to February a little bit later here. But my biggest takeaway, the reason this has all gone south, the reason this is, uh, you know, obviously not been a banner month for this team is very simply because uh, the Ranger players just haven't gotten the job done. That's my biggest takeaway from this entire month is that this losing streak, this cold streak here, it's on the players and not the coaches. I'm not going to write the Rangers off, like I said, just because they had a lousy month. Um, But when you look at what's happened over the last handful of seasons here, the Raiders now have their third head coach in four seasons. And and one of the craziest parts about this to me is that they've been very good, you know, overall, haven't always gotten the ending that we would have liked, but they've been very good in the most recent three seasons, this one included. And yet the coaches, you know, are, are constantly being changed. You had David Quinn, kind of a little bit overbearing of a coach, I think, you know, somebody that I think was brought in specifically to work with young players and the Rangers didn't really seem to back him when uh, his job was kind of on the line. Draw Galant, it was more of the same. He was here for two years and, you know, different kind of a coach, a little bit more hands off, kind of lets the players just be themselves for the most part. And obviously he's no longer here. And again, at the end of last year, you didn't hear too many Ranger players coming to the defense of Draw Galant. So, He's gone, and now Peter Laviola comes in, and certainly a fiery, uh, no nonsense kind of a coach, and you know has a very specific way that he wants things done, pushes players hard. I, I think you know the best way to describe Laviola is tough but fair. But the bottom line is, again, three coaches in the last four years, and all three of these coaches very unique and very different from one another. So at a certain point, this has to fall on the players, and I haven't seen too many, you know, Ranger fans on Twitter, you know, getting all upset with LaViolette yet, but I I do think that will happen if it continues. But again, at a certain point, uh, this has to fall on the players because if they don't want, you know, David Quinn, 
the, the teaching kind of a coach, the guy that is brought in specifically to work with young players. They don't want Gallant because he's hands off. And now they don't, don't want uh, Peter Laviolette, who has, you know, a very specific system in mind. Um, you know, exactly who do you want to play for? So, uh, again, I'm not willing to say that, like, they've quit on Laviolette or anything like that. I don't think we're anywhere near uh, that point. But, you know, again, I, I just think that at a certain point, these these players have to decide that, um, you know, this is the coach. This is the guy that we're going to play hard for and run through a wall every single night and uh, just make it happen. Because, again, I just don't see how, you know, at a certain point, you, you just can't keep blaming the coaches over and over and over again. Laviolette can't go out there and uh, make them defend better on the rush. He can't make them fight for loose pucks or go to the net or have any kind of defensive struggles or, or anything like that. Um, so, yeah, again, it, it falls on the players at a certain point. Another general hockey takeaway that I wanted to throw out there uh, right now is that the Metro Division, and this is kind of reflected on the Rangers still being in first place right now, despite playing, you know, very subpar hockey for basically all of January and maybe even the later parts of December as well. The Metro Division is not quite as good as we thought that it was. Um, despite the skid, the Rangers are 30, 16, and 3. That means that they've won more than 60% of their games. It also means they're in first place in the Metro with 63 points. And again, the Canes are right behind them. But there are a lot of disappointing teams. The Caps obviously started hot this year. They're now 22, 18, and 7. So they've really fallen off second to last in the division. The Devils, you know, everybody thought they were going to be big time this season. They are now 24, 20, and 3. I mean, they already won the Stanley Cup last year when they beat the Rangers, right? That, those are their words, not mine. The, the Devils players, there were multiple players on the Devils talking about how that was their Stanley Cup matchup against the Devils. So, hey, they won their cup last year, and uh, maybe they've just not been quite as motivated this year. And I know they've had some injuries in all fairness, but the Devils are uh, certainly a disappointing team so far. Islanders and Penguins, I mean, both inconsistent at best. Islanders have won only two of their last 10 games. Uh, the Penguins have won only four of their last 10 in this division right now, the Metro, there is only one team that has won more than five of its last 10 games, and that's the Canes, who were 7-2-1 and one in their last 10 games. You know, the Flyers, they're still in third place, still in a playoff position, but they're on a five-game losing streak, and all five of those losses have occurred in regulation. So, you know, all these teams have kind of been up and, up and down, and they've all got their issues individually, and they've all gone through some slides. And honestly, kind of like a subplot of this whole thing here, it makes me realize a little bit, it makes me uh, have a takeaway that, you know, maybe what the Rangers are going through isn't nearly as nightmarish as we're all making it out to be. And I include myself in that because, like I said, there have been a couple episodes recently where I've kind of gone in on them. But the Rangers aren't the only team in this division that's been uh, a little bit up and down. They're not the only team that's gone through some rough times that uh, have some flaws. I think certainly that applies to really every team in this entire division. And uh, for the most part, like I said, that that's a big takeaway for me is that I thought the Metro would be the best division in hockey. But Right now, it kind of looks like the worst, and that's not to say there aren't good teams and there aren't teams that could go on a run in the playoffs, but that's just where things stand, uh, at least if you go by the standings. So that's a big uh, takeaway for me so far this season. All right, we just want to let everybody know that today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers is brought to you by our good friends at FanDuel. Happy Super Bowl to all who celebrate from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. If you're like me, Super Bowl Sunday is all about scoring the best seat on the couch grabbing your favorite football snacks, and placing some super bets. FanDuel has so many ways for you to win at the end of the season and claim a W or two or three. Not only can you bet on who will win Super Bowl 58, but FanDuel also has bets for which players will score a touchdown, how many points will be scored, and so much more. New customers, join today, and you'll get up to $200. You will get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. And today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers is also brought to you by Factor. Get started on your resolutions with Factor so you're ready for the new year. Factor's ready-to-eat meal delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in the new year. Skip the grocery stores, the prep work, and cooking fatigue. Instead, get chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door with over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more, plus over 55 weekly add-ons, you will have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your resolutions. Forget 
Frantic lunch preps and rush dinners, Factor's two-minute meals are your secret weapon in the new year. Fuel up fast with restaurant-quality meals all delivered right to your door. Factor now offers loads of snack options like breakfast, smoothies, juices, snacks, and more to keep everybody going no matter what is on the schedule. Stress less over meal times in the new year. Factor's no prep, no mess meals. Free up time that is otherwise spent shopping, cooking, and cleanup. No more wasting time in the kitchen. Head to factormeals.com slash locked on NHL 50 and use code locked on NHL 50 to get 50% off. That's code locked on NHL 50 at factormeals.com slash locked on NHL 50 to get 50% off. All right, so big shout out to the everydayers as always. Thank you guys as always for uh, tuning into the Locked On New York Ranger podcast. Definitely want to come back tomorrow. We actually uh, just got done recording with Vince Mercagliano. That's going to be tomorrow's episode. Uh, talk a little bit about you know the Rangers trade deadline plans and just the way that losing Philip Hedo for the season is going to affect them. Uh, a couple other things as well. The core of the team, you know, do they need to step up? And uh, also taking a couple of your questions from the mailbag and uh, reading those to Vince. So definitely looking forward to getting that episode out to you guys. But for right now, uh, let's go ahead and stick on this uh, topic that we're covering right now. And that's, of course, the biggest takeaways from the New York Rangers for the month of January. And for me, the Rangers, you know, there, there's a lot that we can discuss going into the trade deadline. And of course, you know, with Philip Hedo being out for the season, that does open up some cap space and does create, um, you know, some possibilities as far as what they could do. You know, are they going to get creative? Will they go for one big player, a couple complimentary players? There's a lot to talk about here. But one player that I want to get on this team, it's not a specific person in terms of like, you know, that guy over there. It's a type of player. I just want the Rangers to add likely a forward who plays every shift like it's his last. We need that guy out there who's just a high motor guy going 100 miles per hour no matter what, no matter uh, how the team's been doing lately, no matter what the score is, no matter what period is. You know, some of us have, kind of uh, lamented Mika and Kreider recently where it feels like there's times where they're not going full bore. I mean, they're great players. And when they're at their best, I mean, they are excellent players in this league. They've both been all-stars. And, um, you know, obviously they've both had their moments, you know, with all the years that they've spent playing for the Rangers. But I'm just looking for the Rangers to bring in somebody that's kind of a tone setter. And you hear that term tone setter and you think like physical and hitting. Look, if, if this player does those things, that's great. But I'm talking more just... Crazy amounts of effort, never slows down, going full bore. You know, he'll mix it up a little bit. He'll get in somebody's face um, at the end of a play. And as I say all this, it's making me realize just how much I would like to see a reunion between the Rangers and Frank Vetrano. Vetrano having a career season, you know, the kind of uh, downside to acquiring to acquiring Vetrano is that he's up to 21 goals and 14 assists and uh, probably the best season that he's ever had in the NHL. So, uh, call me crazy. I don't think the Rangers are going to be able to get him for just a fourth round draft pick this time around. That's that's all they gave up for him uh, the last time. But regardless, it might be worth bringing him in anyway. He seemed to click pretty well with Mika and with Kreider. And again, just somebody that brings that feistiness. He'll get in your face a little bit. Just one of those guys you don't have to worry about, man. He's just always ready to go out there, play some hockey, uh, has a good all around game. He back checks very hard. Um, good defensive winger as well. And like I said, you know, he'll, he'll get in your face and he'll mess with you a little bit. And I, th I think the Rangers need just a little bit more edge in that regard. There's just too many times recently where the team has been flat. Frank Vitrano doesn't seem like the tail player that's going to come out flat uh, all that often. So um, he's just one example, whether it's him though, or somebody else that kind of has that feistiness, has that little bit of an edge to their game. Uh, give me somebody like that. And you know, if you bring back Vetrano, if it is him and he plays with Mika and Kreider, he can kind of keep those two honest a little bit. And, um, you know, obviously I think Vetrano would represent certainly an upgrade. And look, Mika and Kreider, those two have to be able to figure it, figure it out if they're on the ice with somebody else. Like, you know, it, it can't just be that they need a superstar with them. I mean, they're two of the Rangers' top three highest paid forwards. And as such, they should be able to get it rolling almost regardless of who's playing right wing with them. But I do think if they brought in Vitrano, uh, he would certainly be the best player that they've played with uh, this season. Uh, that is for sure. Uh, another big takeaway from the month of January, and I'm just going by the stats for this one, and, you know, the eye test too, I suppose. But Igor Shesterkin has a weakness. They said during Igor's last start that he has now given up 20 goals on his glove side. There was only 19 goals allowed by Igor on his glove side the year prior, and he seems to be getting beaten, you know, high glove side pretty often. There, there's times where, you know, it seems like players are kind of picking that corner of the net. 
You know, Igor, he went through a little bit of a funk last year, too, when the whole team was struggling in the fall. But at that time, unless I just didn't notice it, it didn't really seem like there was a certain type of shot that he was getting beaten on, a certain location of a shot that he was getting beaten on. He just wasn't playing his best. But now that's really starting to stand out more and more, the more games that go by. And uh, the more that Igor, you know, scuffled in the month of January, uh, it just became apparent that that's where teams are looking to go against him. And at times he hasn't really had any answers. So needs to be ready there, needs to get better there. You know, him and Benoit Allaire can go back to the drawing board or whatever. Um, but, you know, it looks like teams are attacking him there. And unless Igor starts to, you know, close the floodgates a little bit when it comes to that high shot on the glove side, it seems like uh, that's likely to continue. So uh, Igor has a little bit of a weakness right now. Hopefully he can figure it out. And um, again, just get back to being the goalie that we've all known him to be for his four, first four seasons in the league. And one that's kind of a link to what I just said here, another takeaway, we're getting like a little bit close to at least something of a goalie controversy and I can't even believe I'm saying that based on where we thought our two goalies were heading into the season. You know, Igor Shesterkin's two years away from winning the Vezda. He was very good last year as well. I think uh, most of us had him pegged at the very least as like a top five goalie in the NHL and maybe even the absolute best. I mean, that's something that I think you could at least make a case for coming into the season. I do think Igor's better than certainly he's played so far this year, his track record would back me up on that, what he's done the other four seasons that he's had in the NHL. But facts are facts. He's having uh, the worst season of his career thus far, and uh, it's really not even close. And when you look at the numbers, Igor is 19-12-1 with an 899 uh, save percentage, a 286 goal, goals against average, very un -Igor like numbers. Quick, meanwhile, 10-4-2, a 915 save percentage, a 243 goals against average, and two shutouts. That's another thing. Igor Shesterkin still looking for his first shutout uh, so far of the season. Hopefully, he gets it sooner rather than later. But I'm just wondering, man, like at a certain point, is there something to talk about going into the playoffs if it continues like this? I don't think so. I think eventually we're going to see Igor play better hockey. Obviously, he's quite a bit younger. He's like 10 years younger than Jonathan Quick. And to me... And I talked about this in our upcoming episode with Vince, because like I said, we, we recorded that episode with Vince Mercagliano. The Rangers' best chance of being the final team standing, if you believe that can happen, and you think that, you know, they've got a run in them and that they're way better than what they've shown in January, and, you know, they're a lot closer to the team they showed to be in, in, in the fall, if they can get back to that, to me, the best chance of them lifting that beautiful Stanley Cup over their heads is for Igor Shosturkin to figure it out, not to keep riding, you know, a 38-year-old goalie who, again, has been awesome this season. It's been so cool to see him kind of turn things around. But to me, that's the more likely outcome. It, it's the same thing I said when the Rangers were down three games to one to the Penguins. And there were a couple people, and you could make a case for this. I mean, even even going back back in time now and looking at it, uh, the Rangers were down 3-1 to the Penguins. Igor had gotten just pummeled in games three and four, got yanked out of both those games. There were people saying they should start Georgiev in game five. I didn't like it because, again, to me, if the Rangers were to come back and win that series, go on any kind of a run, which they did, the better chance of that happening was for their all-world goalie to start once again playing like an all-world goalie. And it's nothing against Georgiev back then. It's nothing against Jonathan Quick now. But to me, uh, your best chance of, again, being the final team there uh, is Igor Shosturkin rediscovering his game or at least getting close to what he showed two years ago and really uh, the vast majority of his career. He played very well in the playoffs last year too, uh, was let down by his teammates. To me, Igor's still the guy. Um, but again, if it continues like this, there, there's at least a little bit of a debate to be had. You know, I think about a hypothetical, like what if there's a playoff series and Igor like gets lit up in game one? Like, do you go to Jonathan Quick in game two if you're down one nothing in the series? It's an interesting debate, interesting food for thought, but I just think they're going to pretty much ride Igor Shesterka and they're going to go about as far as uh, as he can as he can carry them. It's not all on Igor, but uh, obviously goaltending play. You have to have good goal goaltending play in the playoffs if you're going to go on any kind of a run. Another big takeaway here: the Rangers still have not figured out how to replace Pavel Buchnevich. It's not for a lack of experimentation. We've seen countless players since Buchnevich left uh, play with Mika and play with Kreider on that top line. It just has never really felt the same since when. Buchnevich was here, and I'll say, I'll repeat what I just said to kind of emphasize this a little bit further, is that, you know, Kreider and Mika, they they have to be able to figure out with somebody not named Pavel Buchnevich. But, you know, the, the fact is that that trade, at the time, like I said, I can I can understand Drury's line of thinking, but, you know, you, you look at the way everything has panned out and how good Buchnevich has been for the Blues. 
You know, they gave a lot of uh, the money that could have gone to Buchnevich to guys like, you know, Sammy Blay, Ryan Reeves. And, and Reeves was awesome, man. I really liked having Reeves here. I thought he uh, helped the Rangers with their confidence, their swagger a little bit. And, um, you know, obviously he was going to watch out for his teammates out there. Just a cool dude, and I I'm glad he was here for a while. Um, but he was here. And then Patrick Nemeth making like $2.5 million per season. They brought him in the same offseason where they, you know, traded away Buchnevich. So it, it just didn't work out. And, and lo and behold, you know, three years later here, they are still trying to figure out what to do there. And, you know, you could always break up Kreider and Mika. That's something we've talked about too. But, um, yeah, that that's a big takeaway for me is they still have not quite figured out what to do with that top line right wing spot. And we're talking three, well, two and a half seasons uh, since Buchnevich last played a game for the New York Rangers. So, Got a couple more. Uh, we want to uh, shift our attention to Brian Othman. I, I feel like I'm kind of in the minority here, but uh, I'm going to have, I, I guess, something of a hot take on Brian Othman coming up. Uh, a couple of other things we want to get into as well. Another uh, takeaway as it pertains to the trade deadline. And we'll get to all that stuff in just a second here. First, though, we definitely want to let everybody know that today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you will always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber and not cash. With all the parts you need at all the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. All right, let's go ahead and keep everything rolling here. A couple more before we uh, call it a day. So uh, one that I have on Brennan Othman is that and this is going to depend a lot on a couple of different factors. First of all, how do the Rangers look going forward here? And secondly, we're about five weeks away from the uh, trade deadline. I believe just slightly more than that. How? What, what do the Rangers do at the trade deadline? Who do they bring in? How do they kind of fill out this roster? If the Rangers start playing a heck of a lot better, and if they add a couple of important players and namely a, you know, a significant winger, because obviously Offman's a winger. If they do all that, then I'll back off on this a little bit. But for the time being, if the Rangers continue to sputter and continue to play 500 hockey or worse, and if the trade deadline comes and goes and they don't really do anything significant and or they don't add a winger, then I got to have uh, Brian Offman get another opportunity with the uh, Rangers this season. And I, again, I feel like I'm in the minority here. I feel like I'm kind of swimming upstream when I say this. And I understand hesitation on the part of Ranger fans because we've seen them rush certain players to the NHL level, and it hasn't always worked. You know, Alexi Lafreniere and Capo Caco, they've made their contributions here and there. But I think, you know, for where they are in their careers this many years in, fourth year for Lafay, uh, fifth year for Caco, you probably would have thought you'd be getting a little bit more from both those players, certainly Caco. Uh, I don't think that's an unfair thing to say, and that they kind of did rush those guys. They both skipped the AHL entirely. You've also got, I mean, the more disastrous examples are Kravtsov and Anderson, but honestly, I mean, those two, it just didn't seem like it was ever really going to work out. They both had immaturity issues, and they both went to other places and didn't really do much of anything. So I, I don't know that that really had a whole lot to do with any of it. And they, they both played at the Wolfpack a little bit, but they did rush them along a little bit as well. Um, but, you know, a, a counterpoint that I'll make there Chris Kreider. Kreider had just finished winning a national title, and the Rangers took him and threw him into a playoff series. The middle of a playoff series between the Rangers and the Senators, he made his debut in Game 2 of that series, and he played the entire playoff run that season, and by the end, like, had a pretty significant role. I'm, I'm pretty sure he was he was on the line with Ryan Callahan, and without, you know, looking at the depth chart, I gotta believe that was probably the Rangers' second line. I'm not 100% on that, but they were using Kreider, and he played well. Um, we've also seen some other guys make their debut at young ages, uh, Keandre Miller and Braden Scheider. I know they can both be up and down a little bit, but for the most part, I do think they've been good players and guys that, you know, seemed like they were ready to go uh, as soon as the Rangers called them up. You know, Keandre Miller had to get a roster spot for himself when when he was kind of uh, he was kind of in the position Will Cooley was in 
going into training camp this year where the odds were against them making the team, but they ended up doing it anyway. And overall, I do think Miller has been a good player for this team. I know he's kind of split the fan base a little bit, but um, overall, I think he's been mostly good. He's had some hiccups here and there. And the same thing can be said for Braden Schneider. Make his debut at 20. He's had to deal with a million different defense partners. He's done just fine uh, for somebody in his position. So, you know, Othman... Now 21 years old, and again, we've seen a lot of Ranger players debut quite a bit younger than 21 years old. Sometimes it's worked, other times it hasn't. But Othman right now, up to 10 goals with the Wolf Pack. He trails only Alex Belzeal, Brett Berard, and believe it or not, he still trails Johnny Brodzinski, who hasn't played a game for the Wolf Pack in months. Um, but he's got 10 goals as Othman. He's also got 19 assists. He trails only Belzeal and Mac Hollowell in that department. He's a minus six. Uh, also leads the Wolf Pack with 111 shots on goal. And that's another thing that the Rangers could really use right now. They need somebody, I mentioned Vitrano earlier, somebody that's not going to hesitate and fire the puck at the net. And Brandon Othman is that guy. He's got a heck of a shot. You watch the Ranger power play right now, and I'm not saying they're going to like vault Othman onto the top power play unit. I wouldn't expect that at all. But they need somebody with a shoot first mentality. And right now, they don't have it. Panarin's been, uh, I don't know if I would say shoot first, but he's, shooting quicker than he has in other years. He, he's more decisive with his shot than he has been. But you watch like the power play and even the top line. I mean, it's just pass, 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 pass. We need somebody that's a sniper and, and Brian Hoffman can be that guy. Now, could he come up here and be completely overwhelmed and you just decide he's not ready? That's possible too. Obviously, he played the three games for the Rangers earlier this year. Looked awesome, I thought, against the Blackhawks. Didn't really stand out a whole lot the other two games. But at a certain point, you know, this team's trying to win the Stanley Cup and it gets to a situation where it's like, what do you really have to lose here? Like, are you this terrified? You know, I hear people say like, well, he's not there defensively. It's like, okay, well, you know, how many defense only forwards does this team need? You know, there, there's quite a few of them right now. Even after Bonino got waived and, you know, ultimately uh, reassigned to the Hartford Wolfpack. I mean, you've got Pitlick. He's not going to give you any offense. VZ. VZ will give you some offense, and I'm a big VZ fan, and I've campaigned for him to maybe even get a shot with Mika and Kreider. Um, but, you know, for the most part, he has cooled off offensively. You think of him as more of like a gritty defense first forward. Obviously, Goodrow, defense first forward. Johnny, I mean, Brodzinski's kind of, I wouldn't really call him that, but he's not giving you a whole lot offensively as well. At a certain point, and again, this depends on what the Rangers do at the deadline. If they don't add anyone significant on the wing, then I think Othman, at a certain point, needs another look. And that becomes even more true if the Rangers continue to scuffle. You know, the it, cliche or not, there, there's this thing in sports where, well, you know, we think this guy can maybe give us a spark. Well, I like Brandon Othman's chances of doing that more so than I like somebody like, you know, Pitlick or like Riley Nash, you know, Alex Belzeal. Belzeal is having a good season with the Wolfpack. But in terms of upside and let's roll the dice here and let's see if we can spark this team, I think Hoffman's the guy. And again, I, I feel like most will disagree with me. That's fine. You can let me know in the comments section how wrong I am. Uh, I'd certainly appreciate other opinions and everything, but that's where I'm at. If, if they're in a spot where they continue to struggle, continue to sputter, and they haven't added anyone big, Give me Brian off and getting another crack uh, with the New York Rangers. And if it doesn't work out, you send him back down. If he's up here and his head is spinning after six or eight games, you send him back down. I don't think it's going to completely destroy his confidence and ruin his development. Um, you know, he'll go back to the Wolfpack and he'll pick it up right where he left off. And uh, hopefully, you know, he'll be a factor for the Rangers somewhere down the road. But again, uh, Offman, I think it becomes a very real possibility if the team struggles. And I got one more takeaway for you guys here. This also has to do with the uh, the trade deadline. The Rangers, as far as what their approach should be at the deadline, and, and we've talked about a couple of different things, a couple of different players they could bring in. Should they target this position? Should they target that position? I think right now the Rangers need to take a little bit of a wait-and-see approach because I see a lot of people on social media, even like, you know, media members saying that like, oh man, this, this is not the year to go all in if you're the Rangers. And I get why they're saying that. It's because the Rangers, you watch them in January, they did not look like a Stanley Cup champion in the making. I'll be the first one to admit that. But they looked awesome earlier in the year. And if you don't go all in this year, and keep in mind, despite their struggles, still first place in the Metro Division, uh, playoffs are looking obviously very good. And obviously, hopefully they can hold on for the division crown. But if you don't go all in this year, what's going to be different next year? You know, the core of this team is not really going to change that much. The Rangers have a certain amount of players. They're locked into multi-year contracts. Most of them have no move clauses. The only thing that's going to be different next year is all these players are going to be one year older. 
and you might be in a situation where you're not in first place in the Metro division. I mean, we, you never know for sure how it's going to go. Maybe at this time next year, the Rangers are like a fringe playoff team in one of the wild card spots. You want to go all in then? I mean, to me, it makes more sense to do it now. Now, you don't do it completely recklessly. I'm not stating to you got to trade Brian Offen, trade Gabe Perot. I wouldn't do that. Um, draft picks, I don't get all bent out of shape about draft picks. You can always uh, find a way around that. You can always um, acquire draft picks by moving other players somewhere down the line. You know, they got a first rounder for Nils Lundqvist, who, I mean, I don't really know how he's doing with Dallas this year. I haven't really paid attention to that, but. Um, got off to a rough start there. They got a first round draft pick for him. Um, so, you know, these draft picks come and go and there's no guarantee that any player is going to work out, uh, that you take him in the draft, you know? So, uh, for all those reasons, I just think that the Rangers should look to be aggressive and, and should look to, you know, bolster this roster a little bit, give them a little bit more depth and, uh, you know, see how it goes. But again, getting back to my original point here. I don't think the Rangers need to decide now because everybody's talking about, oh, they got to go all in or they got to, uh, you know, they, they, they can't go all in. Bottom line is the Rangers between now and the trade deadline play 13 more games. And there's a lot of, you know, pretty winnable games in that bunch. Um, but I, I think the way they play there might determine exactly how aggressive the Rangers are going to be uh, come trade deadline time. I know there's been times in the past where Drury likes to kind of get a jump on everything. We saw him uh, trade for F Frank Vetrano quite some time before the trade deadline two years ago. Same thing with uh, Tarasenko and Mikola last year. Um, I think this year, maybe a, a little bit more of a wait and see approach. I mean, you don't want to let the market pass you by and all these teams start trading and you're left out in the cold, but I think it makes sense to just see how the Rangers do uh, coming out of this break. It doesn't have to be determined now how all in you go. Um, the people saying you can't go all in, I won't understand that, but you know, you look at the Rangers schedule coming out of the break they should be able to win a good amount of games in February. It gets off to a tough start, home against the Avs, home against the Lightning. After that, basically the rest of February, you're looking at a bunch of non-playoff teams that are playing the Rangers and the Stars. The Stars are like the one like really good team that they play after those first two games. And then the first two games in March before the deadline at Toronto, home Florida. So... You know, there's some good teams there for sure, but I also think this break is going to do the Rangers some good. I think they should be able to take advantage of what is a pretty weak schedule in February for the most part, the first two games notwithstanding. Um, but again, sit back, see how it goes, and then determine how aggressive you want to be and determine, okay, do these guys look like Stanley Cup champions? Is this a team that could legitimately make a run? Uh, we're going to have to just wait and see and find out. But uh, regardless, the, you can't understate the importance of how big uh, these games are going to be coming out of the break here in February, because I think they could go a long way toward determining what the Ranger approach at the deadline is going to be. Uh, but I figure we could pretty much call it there for today. Once again, if you guys would like to get in touch with this podcast, please send an email to LockedOnNYRangers at gmail.com. Once again, that is LockedOnNYRangers at gmail.com. Definitely give us a follow on Twitter as well, at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. Once again, that's at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. And definitely subscribe to Locked On New York Rangers YouTube channel. Thanks again, guys. I will see you next time.